That's not unusual. Oh, so everyone hears me. <laughs> this is Kyle's plan, by the way. Kyle's like, I'm going to be the host and I'll just leave you with the questions. And then he's like, oh, I can't. My mic's not working. So you have to be the one doing all the talking now. That's great. <laughs> That's exactly it. And now I'm back. Boom. Audio issues. Uh, it would not be a geek cast without an audio issues. Uh, my mic's not broken. Um, it was just set to default device. And for some reason, Windows 11 doesn't like default to be an active system so yay that uh so welcome to the february edition of geekcast future now uh today i'm joined by the lovely mindy green uh who is an expert in all things msp and future and now um so i appreciate mindy i appreciate you stopping by and taking time out of your busy 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 um life schedule all of that goodness goodness for joining yeah for joining i mean me. i think you didn't really even have to ask right you like mentioned it and i was like oh i want to do that right is that how exactly happens? what happened you were like i'll clear all <laughs> my, my entire day for it we'll just sit and talk for days yeah um, i remember that too i do have to go to bed at some point uh i am not a robot <laughs> like you are so we need to keep this to at least midnight uh, at a minimum all right fine i guess i can control myself maybe i appreciate that um i, I will have you know that i am recording affected like it's 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 showing <laughs> um yeah i have a i have a trouble with that i don't know why every time i do something i can't like <laughs> you're afraid you'll say something so subconsciously you just won't record maybe that's what it is guys it is. i've done like three or four internal uh like calls like training stuff and every single time i've forgotten to record it <laughs> and i'm like yeah i'll record it i'll record it the last time kyle joined for like a minute he's like mendy hit the record button. And I was like, yeah, Kyle, I know I got this. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> he didn't. He uh, did. Um, so thank you all, all of 30 of you, 50 of you, 1 million of you who are in the audience. I'm just going to assume that number's correct uh, for joining us here. Uh, if you're new, uh, hit the like button, subscribe, give me money. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, I don't think Twitch recognizes that. Uh, so... I can't give you a tax write-off, but we have a merch store. You can buy merch from us. Uh, check out the new Dumpster Fire t-shirt, which went live a couple of days ago. Weeks ago? Weeks ago. This, At least in February, maybe. I don't even recognize when we are, <coughs> where we are. Um, uh, for those of you who are, this is your first time watching a GeekCast, thank you for joining us. We have the rest of them. Uh, on YouTube channel, so youtube.com slash C slash MSP Geek to catch up on all those. They've been fantastic. They've been great. Um, and I guess without further ado, we'll start this thing. I thought we already started. We did start we this, but like officially started. Like get into the deep dive discussions. Uh -huh. Are um, we ready for that? I'm not, but you hopefully are. You are the expert. Uh, I, guess we'll, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> um, so... Uh, this is a topic that we've been discussing offline uh, a lot. Um, and we've we've had plenty of discussions just in general recently about this. Um, how what's the best way you feel to lead from your position? Ah, oh, that is a tough question, mostly because I don't even know. Like, that's the thing. I've only recently been like, uh, okay, so if you take a step back and you like, you just know, you see what people post online, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, uh, if your teammates are having problems, or if your members, if your employees are having issues, it's not them, it's you, right? That's, it's a very, very uh, in your face statement that gets made a lot. Like it's, um, performance is not a measure of the employee, it's a measure of the manager, or the leader, right? So this is, these are things that I've seen for years and I just like, whatever, you know, it's, how's that possible? Like our employees are just, they're not, they're just not performing. Why was that to do with me? Um, and recently I stumbled into, uh, onto a video from Simon Sinek and it didn't start with that. Cause otherwise I just would have ignored it. It started off, it was like a five minute video on leadership and I just watched it and I was hooked. The concepts that he talks about 
uh, changed the perception completely on what I had. So I, you know, I honestly don't know. The question was like, what do I think the best way is to do leadership? I have no idea. I'm still learning. And what I'm learning is that no one really knows either. Even the ones, the experts who are talking about it, they're still also learning what to do or how to do. And the reason is, is because it's completely different for everyone's environment. Everyone's company has their own set of challenges that you have to figure out and overcome. Now, the fundamentals are all the same. The way, uh, the way you act and how you treat people are always going to be the same. Um, I was actually talking about it with Gavin Stone, and he recommended uh, the UK Gavin Stone, I should say, not the US Gavin Stone. And he recommended a book, Nine Minutes on Monday, which is a great book by James Robbins. Um, and it also helped because one of the other things, like the biggest challenges that we have, and I think everyone has, is lack of time to do anything. So how can I, even if I admit that, you know, we have problems with management, but I'm doing the best I can within the limited time that I have. So how can I do better, right? I need more people or I need someone else to do the work or I need to delegate or, but the way the program is designed and, and the book is really a program, nine minutes on Monday, is that all you do is you take nine minutes. There's nine points that you want to focus on every week. And um, for one minute, for each point, you decide who and what you're going to do or go to and discuss and help assist in a specific area. Um, and as you get used to it over time, as you do it, it becomes more natural. Like your entire, the way you think changes, the way you act changes completely, like how your interactions with people um, shift. And what you start seeing is that the responses you get are better. Uh, people are more open to you. Um, and they want to, they actually want to help. You know, it's not just about being a job. It's about trying to do something for you because they feel once they have that relationship of, oh, this is a, someone I want to, I don't want to let down, right? It's someone that they respect then they put more into the job. So it's not about just coming in and getting your paycheck, you know? So let me ask you this um, question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, first off, uh, before I ask you that question, you may want to in introduce what position you do um, to make that a little bit more effective. Um, and second, the, the real question is, uh, how, how do I, how can I apply that all the way down to an engineer level from an engineer perspective how do i know going forward how do i better myself from a leadership perspective how do i gain that ability yeah so that actually goes hand in hand uh my intro and how you can take what i'm saying and apply it day to day even if you're not in a manager position right i think is what you were getting at yep okay so first of all uh hi i'm mendy if you don't know me by now, I'm an admin on MSG Geek. No, that's not, that's really not what I was. That's not the say. position. <laughs> that's not the position. No, I, I started off as a technician in level one. Um, my first, first task or assignment, role, responsibility in my job was to check backups. And yes, it was data. <laughs> Mine was, um, that was my second one, was to check backups. <clears throat> I hated every second of it. I hated every second of it too. And in fact, the, what they used to do is we used to run around, it was actually shadow protect on data and we used to log into every single system and, um, and check manually and then make a note on a spreadsheet. And like, okay, backup check is done, right? And I worked my way up to a level two, three, you know, soon I was actually um, the technical lead. And in short order, I was director of technical services Right now, my current position is CTO. Um, and at the time when they changed my title, I didn't see like a dynamic shift in my position or role. Like I, I've already been doing a lot of the same things. Like I, nothing really changed in my job at the time. It was like, okay, it's just a title. Um, what I've been finding though, and when, I, when I've been reading the nine minutes on Monday and listening to Simon Sinek YouTube videos and I, I have his books, I'm gonna, I was gonna start reading soon. Um, what we're going to, what I've been seeing is a couple of things. 
one primarily, and this ties into your second question. As a technician, I was already doing some of the things, not even close to half, but some of the things I was already doing naturally, um, either because of my personality or just because I don't know, whatever, let's call it my personality. But I was already doing it as a low level tech. And that is how I became a technical lead. Um, and for example, uh, the things that we're talking about here are um, training, right? Provide training, show care, uh, help your, your employees master their job, right? As a level one, level two technician, I was doing my work. But when the guy next to me needed help or I heard I overheard him working on something that he got stuck on and he was like fumbling around or, you know, they needed they had a question that they weren't sure where to go. I was right next to them. And without asking or without being asked, I just provided the input. Um, and it was all, like I was already doing that, the training and I was helping them tell. Yeah, this is right. This is the wrong way. Don't do it this way. Do this. And I wasn't doing it in a bossy way. I hope I really have no idea because I, I can't tell. Right. Mm -hmm. It depends on who you talk to, but it depends on who I talked to today. But back then, who knows what I was doing? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was already doing a lot of that and anyone can do the same thing. It, they don't even have to be knowledgeable at the time. Like I, I was someone who was learning and I figured things out and I was knowledgeable. That's why I was able to do it. But you don't have to be um, any employee, no matter the level, is able to show leadership skills. Uh, because these skills are more about connecting with people than about doing the job correctly. There is a level of doing the job correctly in there, but the majority of it, and the, the point of a leader is to help someone else be the best that they can. Mm -hmm. That is leadership 100%. in, in the, like a summary, right? Yeah. So yeah. anyone can help motivate their coworker, can help show care about their coworkers' life and well-being. They can help encourage um, and, and drive up friendly competition to push things forward. Like these are things that you can do that will help the team that you're on overall, that help the company that you're in. Even if you're not in a manager or leadership position, you'll find yourself naturally moving into one when the people higher up notice and say, hey, that's actually cool. You can do You'd that. Be very You're, beneficial. <laughs> you would be very beneficial if we made that your job officially. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. It's we work for the same company. In case you guys don't already know this. Uh, oh wait, we do. We do. Um, I mean, I don't know what side you work for, but I know what side I work for. Uh, and it's you're right. It's you have to if you can demonstrate you have you have to be able to do your job, right, and extra. So it, it you, you have to make sure that you are accomplishing your tasks and then you can help others. It's, it's super important. And there's a lot of free, like, we're in the age of YouTube. I didn't have YouTube when I was growing up learning how to code HTML and PHP and Dreamweaver and GeoCities. I had to Google it and bookmark websites that had data I needed. <laughs> Yeah, we um, had like it's all text. <laughs> yes, there, there were no fancy <laughs> graphics. You had table structures. Yep, table structures, not even like real diffs like they do now or CSS. CSS didn't exist back then. Oh, good times. But yeah, it's you can apply them from any level, um, and you can the, the YouTube. Just Simon Sinek's a great. You can just look up his videos. He has hours of content you can just listen to. And you can apply that stuff to your everyday life, not just in work. Showing leadership doesn't end at the job. You can show leadership in anything you do. Um, community efforts. Um, show leadership in the community. You can show leadership in anything you, uh, your kids' teams. You can, you know, there's, there's so many ways to apply just the leadership principles that you can start you know, injecting into your life. Again, the, the principles that we're talking about are not about how to do your job. It's about mm -hmm. how to interact with people, which is absolutely not a job specific thing. It is a life skill. And when you start doing it, when you start understanding and seeing what other people are doing and you start connecting with them, it is absolutely a fundamental shift in your life. Like it's a whole new lifestyle change. Um, 
it's like a, it's a talent like everything else like some people are good at sports some people are natural leaders that just that it flows it flows through them that they don't yeah, even there, realize it there are natural leaders that that have it but that doesn't mean that you can't learn to be one or, or work on yourself to be one yeah one of my favorite analogies that simon sinek uses is like uh he's like he goes leadership is it's like brushing your teeth it's like, what happens if you, if you spell, why do we spend two minutes every day, twice a day, brushing your teeth? What does it actually do? It's supposed to spend two Nothing. Minutes? doesn't do anything. But the fact that you're doing it every single day consistently, that's what actually helps keep your teeth clean and healthy. You know, the dentist, when you go to the dentist, let's say you were only to go to the dentist once a year or twice a year, and that's it. You didn't brush your teeth. <laughs> your teeth would be falling out. If you only brushed your teeth and didn't go to the dentist, you'd have a similar problem. You need the combination of both the intense work from the dentist and then the consistent care that you need. Leadership is the same way. If you come in, leadership is all about showing, building connection and showing care. If you come in and you talk to your coworker for a minute and say, hey, how are you? How's your wife? How's your kids? Is everything okay? You know, catch up. If you do that once a month, they're going to be like, whatever, he's just doing it because he feels he has to. But if you're doing it every single day consistently, which is the key, that's the consistent, um, consistent reoccurring action, whatever it is that you're doing, you're saying hello to your coworker, your, your every action that you take uh, for them, if you're doing it consistently, it builds trust. The automatically, and even against their will, the coworker starts to trust that every day you're going to come and ask them how they're doing. And it's not going to be, oh, he's doing because he has to, because he's doing it every single day. So obviously he cares or she cares. I don't know why I keep saying he, it's he or she natural lexicon. <laughs> and what we're, what we're going to, what they're going to, what you're going to end up seeing is because of that level of trust, the other person is going to open up to you naturally mm -hmm. when something, when there's a difficult situation in their life and it's impacting their work performance, you're going to know about it and you're going to be able to take steps to help. You know, and if there's something good in their life, you're going to hear about that, too. Yep. If they're struggling with their job and there's a reason for it, if they don't trust you, why would they come to you to tell you that they're struggling with their job? And what you're going to be seeing is you go to them and say, hey, how are you doing? Is everything OK? Like, oh, no, no, it's all fine because they don't trust you to tell you the truth. In reality, oh, yeah, I'm actually having trouble. Can I get some help on this one task? Right. Okay. You want them to be able to feel comfortable to tell you that and building that trust. And that goes into metrics too, because business Absolutely is all about metrics. metrics. As soon as they yep. figure out what metrics they're doing, they're going to fluff those metrics if they're struggling because they don't want you to yell at them. They yeah, don't have that trust. Building trust is absolutely essential. And the way you do that is by building that connection. They, they trust that you're there. Yep. So yes, absolutely. And, and again, this is something that you can do regardless of whether or not you're a manager, right? You are able to, to help the team because in the end, the team's performance and the company, like company success is your success. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. Right. And your success from the company perspective, your success is a company success because you're all tied together. You're in it together. You're it's part a symbiotic so even, relationship. Symbiotic. Even if you're not in a individualized team, the company is still your team. So if you are able to assist your worker, regardless of whether or not you're a manager or higher up, if you can help your worker and your worker can help you, your coworkers, then you are both helping each other, obviously, and you're also helping the company succeed, which helps you even more. Yep. Uh, and really care. <laughs> um, you can easily go through every day and fake being a leader. Um, it's totally possible, but people pick up on that if you don't really care. If you're like, hey, how you doing? And they trust you to give you some pertinent information and you react as if you've got better things to do, that's that's out the window. That trust is gone, and it's going to take a lot longer to build back up. Yeah, trust is very easy to break. It's very hard to build. Um, I I've been inhaling like hours and hours of Simon Sinek, so I I have a lot of things that he uses that I like. One of them is uh, a friend a friend of his. I think it was a general or somebody in the military said, "A sign of a good leader is that you walk up to someone and you ask, how are you doing? You're standing there waiting for his answer." Mm -hmm. You're not moving on like, oh, how are you? Oh, I got to get to the meeting. How are you doing? I'm going to a meeting. Sorry, I can't catch up. You know, if you're asking the question, you better be standing there waiting for the answer because otherwise you're just, you're just not, you don't care. Even if you don't care, you should still be waiting there pretending you do 
because that will come over time. And ask follow-up questions. I'm giving all yes. my secrets away. <laughs> ask follow-up questions. <laughs> Uh, but this is important like the is. other thing is just one one more thing i'm going to talk i'm going to touch on about that is even if you don't care right when you start to pretend that you care if you go through the actions correctly then you will find yourself caring mm -hmm. it's how you, the human nature works right so when you give away part of yourself you also get something and yep. when you get something you also give part, part of yourself away so even just pretending that act over time with a consistent, oh, look, I'm, I'm only doing it to be a good leader, but I'm doing it. Guess what? <laughs> You're going to find yourself caring. It's going to be, it's going to be what happens. Humans You'll get find yourself working to be a good leader. Um, I mean, I, I'll never forget the time that we went to IT. I went to IT nation with our CEO and we got back and had a good time and everything was well. And then you said, by the way, uh, cause you told me that he said I knew too many people. Um, <laughs> And I didn't think I knew that many people. <laughs> and then I still we say that every day. I, every time I, I see Kyle talking to people, I'm like, Kyle, you know too many people. <laughs> we we uh, it's because I care, Mindy. We we went back to IT Nation this past year, uh, and again we hung out, we had chats, we had fun, we met people, and we had introductions and stuff. And then Mindy was like, Kevin was right. You know too many people. <laughs> and I was like, What do you mean? Uh. uh and it, it's I didn't realize how many people I talked to because I care. I care about you, Mindy. How are you doing? I appreciate that, Kyle. I, I don't know. I'm kind of like uh, my voice is getting a little hoarse right now. I think I need to drink a water. Actually. Drink some water. I can fill in. You know what? I'm, I can fill in this time. Um, you know, this is called a segue and like legit speak. Uh, it's it's a way to move from one section to another and moving on from leadership, which can be in this next topic we're going to discuss. We've, we've hit on this multiple times through the future nows and leadership is probably the first one we've actually discussed, which is really nice. Um, little change up of, of normal pace. Um, but the, the constant landscape of technology is changing and it's changing, uh, based on the given day, um, rapidly or slowly. And it's, it's very confusing some days on what's the new hotness, uh, what's down that can no longer be trusted, uh, what can we actually rely on to make sure we're serviced and our clients are serviced. So how do you keep up and how do you train technicians to keep up with the current trends and the future trends and to prepare for those future trends? Uh, that is a great question and unfortunately there is no good answer <laughs> because what happens is that like you said everything changes all the time and you have to balance the time between work and keeping up there has to be that 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 balance because i could spend all day learning things and get nothing done now I'm making myself more valuable for the company, but I'm not using that knowledge. So how is that valuable? Right. I can spend all month learning new things and still get nothing done. Right. Because of how often things, because of how quick and how fast paced the technology industry is, you could literally spend your entire time learning without actually using that knowledge. And there has to be that balance where you're using it for the company, which is the reason why you're learning, unless you're learning just to learn at that point go be a scholar and, and leave the tech world for someone else. Um, so I, I try to find two things. Number one is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? When you have a uh, shared responsibility, kind of like a community sourcing almost, um, you have, if you have a strong team, if your people are talented, and you're all staying up. To, you all have different interests in technology. You don't have to learn everything. You learn your interests and you stay on and you set times as to when you start and stop, so to speak, put limits on how much time you spend on it. And other people on your team have their own interests. They're going to be doing it. And then together, you guys make a solid uh, knowledge base of sorts because you all have your areas that you like. Um, so you don't have to learn everything. You just have to learn 
enough to contribute. Now, obviously, if you have a team that are all interested in the same thing and all you guys are doing is learning the same thing over and over again, then it's not really helpful. You guys are all one mind. The idea is, is that you want to have a, um, a different types of knowledge that are that is being learned, uh, different articles. So like I know one of my team, he spends almost his entire time after work on Reddit. I'm almost never on Reddit. Um, like always on other types think. of sites. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that's, you know, you stay on top of articles, you, 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 you subscribe to your interests, you join the communities, um, and you stay on top of alerts. That's, that's really what you, what you want to do. But the thing is, and it's not just about the changing trends, because there has to be a level of getting your team to that point where they're following and understanding. Um, there is a whole set of skills that you should be learning first that I don't know whether you should be learning or whether the company should be training you on. It's, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, and What are those skills? Well, <laughs> primarily it's critical thinking. If I were to sum it up in two words, critical Sounds thinking like skills good... are the most important set of skills you'll ever use in your life. It doesn't, not just IT. And we see that in a lot of people that are coming in fresh, they don't have them. Uh, people either are relying or become reliant on knowledge base articles or documentation that you guys have. Um, they become reliant on asking questions from people who are higher up, right? And this actually ties into what we were talking about earlier, leadership, right? As a good leader, you have to be able to train your employee in the right way. That doesn't mean giving them all the knowledge and, don't, and doing a brain dump of information that they can then, oh, okay, here, what is one plus one? Look that up, that's two. No, they have to know to get to one plus one, you have to count one, two. Oh, it's two. There's a critical thinking aspect that you have to help them hone, which you can teach. It is mm -hmm. a skill you can teach and it is a skill you can learn. Some people have it naturally, just like leadership and other skills, but it is something you can teach. It's also very difficult to teach. Um, so you so, feel that focusing on specific skills will allow them to, regardless of what the technologies are, cloud, local, space, will allow absolutely. them to succeed. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. They, the, a person who has proper critical thinking skills and is able to think a problem through with zero knowledge, he will or she will learn just from being in that environment. So you can take someone who is non-technical, throw them into a MSP at tier one level and watch them just from doing the work and observing grow into a tier two, tier three. Honestly, it's kind of what I did. <laughs> Um, so you're saying you're a super critical thinker? Uh, sure, if you want to call it that. Oh, it's an ego on this one. Super critical thinker? I don't know. <laughs> I, I wouldn't use those words, but if you want to call it that. My point is, is that if I had a skill, any like if it, I don't think I have any skills. <laughs> the only skill I do have, if I have any, is critical thinking. That's it. My ability to walk into a situation, take it apart and make a decision is the only thing that I can do well. And anything else that people think I have is because of that one skill that I have. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, you can have a person, the most important skill they can have is critical thinking. And that is the one that we should be focusing on training and honing. So I'm going to agree with you, um, not, not necessarily on that's the only skill we should be honing, but uh, on that, that's probably your only skill. Uh, and here's why. Yeah. When you face any problem, business related, process related, procedure related, technical related, any problem, how do I get from my house to, to the airport? Uh, you use critical thinking. It's That's the basis for decision making is to be able to think critically about the problem, strip it down to its core issues and solve for those core issues. 
one by one until you get the full solution. You do that with everything. So it makes other tasks that you are assigned to do easier for you. If you're assigned to do build a process or you're assigned to make a procedure or make a business decision, you critical think it until it's perfected. And I would classify you as a super critical thinker, um, sometimes to a fault. Uh, <clears throat> but that is that that's that's the core value, with not just uh, internally you want to have for your technicians, but for your entire staff, because you're not always going to be able to solve an issue by throwing process and procedure at it. You're going to have to build, strip it down to its core. What's the problem? How do I resolve this problem? And what are the exceptions to this problem that I can resolve while doing this to the best of my abilities? Yeah, I, I think the, the critical thinking is one of the most overlooked skills out there. Um, they, people are like, oh, what's your troubleshooting process? What does that mean? You don't have a process that you can just, a process is something you can run. You run through it and you get to the process and ta-da, you're successful. That's not how it works. Right? Or what's your procedure for fixing this issue? That that's also the wrong thing. Okay. Pray. What you need to do is, or if I were to put a process on troubleshooting, it is to think it through <laughs> and figure out what's wrong and then fix it. Right. Uh, another another thing that happens all the time is um when we're working on a situation that's complicated or, or an issue that's going on for a while, the customer likes to ask, well, do you know what the problem is? Well, <laughs> if I knew what the problem was, it would be. 65 or 75 percent fixed already right yep. that's more than half the battle identifying, identifying the problems that problem hard is the first and hardest part because that's where all the critical thinking happens yeah because once, once you've identified it you can easily put a plan method procedure whatever in place patch whatever what have you to fix it exactly. it's that's the easy part right i would say it's like 80 20. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's going to be different in each time, depending on how complicated it is and and how much control you have over whatever's broken. Um, but in some cases, it's it's a uh, you know, it's ninety, it's ninety five five. You know, so it really depends. Um, but it's still like every single time you you're talking to a new person, you're talking to other companies, tech support. They they're always asking about like, process procedure. Well, what is this? And do you have that KB? And do you know that information? Information is good to have. Right. And, and documentation, people are like, oh, documentation is key or uh, what is IT glue? document or die. Right. Or is that they're saying? I think? That's fine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, documentation is important to have. It's not critical. It's not necessary. If you have access to the system and you have critical thinking, you can build the documentation. And anyways, if you already have it, you still want to make sure it's accurate. Right? You don't want to rely completely on it. If it's out of date, then you just did something bad. If so you the, followed it. The best way to describe that is you can automate documentation. You can't automate troubleshooting. But you can automate for problems that reoccur. Well, that, you've already um, found the problem. You already troubleshooted. That's different. Yeah. That's the other thing problem. is, that's true. You're already troubleshooted at that time, and that's why you're able to automate and resolve it automatically. Yeah. Um, the, the, the other thing about training, though, is that and here's the hardest part I find to break people out of doing, and it goes hand in hand with critical thinking. People like to rely on past experience, right? User can't log in. Oh, I've seen that before. It's a bad password. Let's go reset it. <laughs> no, no, no. I've been getting a domain um, trust relationship is broken. Oh, I've seen that before. Let's go remove the computer from the domain and put it back on. No, 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 no. The domain controller is actually outdated. It's been running a copy from four years ago, and that's why the trust is broken. The computer is fine. And in fact, when you take it off the domain, you can't put it back on because the domain controller is broken, right? So there are many, my point is there are many issues. There are many problems that will come through as one item or one issue, when in reality, when you start digging is something else. And technicians, myself included, everyone falls for this. It's a human trait. They, they fall back to past experience and go, oh, I've seen this error before. I've seen this issue before. Here's what it is. And they haven't done any troubleshooting yet to actually make sure it's the same problem. They're just going based off symptoms. <laughs> and they're going, oh, because the symptoms are the same, therefore it's the same problem. Let's try the same steps that worked over there and fix it. And in reality, 
that's not going to work unless you know for sure that the problem is exactly the same and you're not troubleshooting this and you're not trying to fix the symptom. So that's the other biggest problem that we we're trying to train internally our own guys out of is that, and something I've been yelling about for a while is that we want to make sure whenever you have a, a ticket, you're addressing what we call root cause, right? You want to know why something's happening. That's where the critical thinking comes in. Why are you getting a bad password prompt? Why are you getting this message saying that trust is broken? Before you try fixing anything, I call it a, a breaking change. Before you do any kind of breaking changes, you want to gather the right information to identify why it's happening, which will then tell you, once you've identified why and you know the problem, by all means, go back to your previous experience and call on similar situations to fix it. But only when you know you're not addressing a symptom and when you're actually addressing the problem. So basically you're you're specifically saying you you're you can rely on your past experience, which is perfectly acceptable. Just don't act solely on that information. Don't assume you know the problem because you're seeing a symptom. Um, yeah, I had a I had another shorter way of saying it that I can't remember it was right a now. Password going through the passwords about it being locked out and then. Uh... Right. No, I had another way. like I was saying, you can rely on your experience on the knowledge that you gain from your experience, but don't rely on the experience itself. That's what I was saying. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So your past experience will give you knowledge. When you, when you will fix something and you understand why it broke, then you have knowledge about how things work. And that you can rely on. But don't rely on the experience itself because that, that's, not, that's tricky. Until Microsoft may... releases SBS 2019 and then they break all of their known best practices and then there's only one person in the world who could fix no, it. No, I was wondering if you were going to get through this without an SBS comment, but apparently the answer is no. Why would I not bring up SPS? I mean, I've, I've got other jokes that's going to lead into the next segment when we get to that. So prepare yourself for that one too. Um, what's the next segment? <laughs> you know what the next segment is. It's the only segment. Are you going to look at your notes? Yeah, I'm looking at the notes. Under <laughs> um, screening selection and others. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the only thing I just want to bang out one more time about training is, and it's very important, is leadership encompasses training. Right? Identifying where your employees or where your team members, whether or not they're under you or next to you, coworkers or workers, it doesn't make a difference. If you can identify where they need help and assist in teaching them or they assist in them teaching themselves is another thing. I, I tell people on when I do calls and training, like, listen, I'm not here to teach you what I know. I'm here to teach you how to learn. Right. And that goes back to critical thinking. So. From a leadership side, that's that ties directly into how you do that training is also important in leadership. I agree. Wait, no, I disagree. I'm kidding. Why? I completely, I don't know. Okay. Just felt like I should have to disagree with you on something. Um, just, you know, it is what it is. Well, so how are you, Mindy? You good? Yeah, um, Having I'm a good great. time? Enjoying your time here? <laughs> I'm enjoying my time. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, you know, I am enjoying my time. Well, that's good. Um, now comes my favorite segment. I just want to say one other thing. Yep, go ahead. Regarding the critical thinking aspect, mm -hmm. there is a. Um, this is a personal story of mine when I first started in telecom, way way back when. So before I actually did anything for Intellicomp, I was like, oh, I, I was a kid playing with computers, right? I thought I knew what I was doing. I played uh, Packrat. I was a developer know? writing HTML. <laughs> I played Packrat on a machine that I built myself. I was playing, I learned how to type on Hugo's House of Horrors, right? So like I played Skyroads with the space bar, right? So um, I, I thought as a kid, of course, I knew what I was doing. And my first time I actually joined Intellicomp as an intern, at the time, um, my brother actually worked at Intellicomp before me. Um, he doesn't work here anymore. He's been here for 15 years. But at the time, he told me, he's like, listen, Mendy, you're going to follow. I was going to follow his coworker around. It wasn't him. So like, you're going to follow this guy, Mark. And the only thing that I want you to do 
the entire day. It's just one thing. And I was like, yeah, what? I was so eager to like be an intern and follow and learn stuff, right? It's like, you just have to forget. Pretend you don't know anything. You have to forget everything that you think you know about computers because I guarantee you it's all wrong. And Mark is going to show you things that you've never thought you could ever know before. And at the time, of course, me like, oh, whatever, sure, okay, I'll do that. I believe but, that. You know, at in reality, when now today I'm looking back at it and I go, you know, in order to be, in order to do critical thinking, in order for proper troubleshooting to occur, in order for you to not rely on your past experience and and only rely on your knowledge when it's necessary, when it's time, not when it's necessary. There is, it's actually a known thing. There's something called beginner's mindset. And the idea is, is that every problem you approach, you approach pretending like you know nothing. <laughs> As if you don't have any knowledge about what's going on, you approach it with a beginner's mind and it helps you look and see things that you may skip or oversee or overlook because you're expecting to see something, right? So the idea is that everyone has... Um, bias and if you approach a problem as someone who knows what's going on then you're automatically going to have confirmation bias about what the issue is whereas if you approach it with a beginner's mindset and you aren't assuming anything you aren't pretending you know anything you don't know about whatever's going on then you look at the problem and you're able to see more information you're 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 not going to this is something that happens to all humans like you look at probably you're going to ignore it even if you don't intend to you have to actually forget everything you know when you look at it and say, okay, let's not make any assumptions and let's see what's going on. Oh, this person's caps lock is on and that's why the password's not working. Let's turn it off. Ta-da, the user's logged in without having to reset a password. <laughs> that's it. That was the last thing I was going to say. Well, I mean, you just killed all my thunder, Mindy. So why is now... that? Well, I mean, I was got this beautiful segue happening, and then you just interrupted, and we're like super important critical skills skills thing, and I'm just. So like, you were an experienced host, Kyle. This whole thing was supposed to be like, yeah, don't worry about it. I got you. <laughs> well, I mean, that is, I'm that's what I'm experienced hosting because I'm now segueing into our new topic because I'm I'm putting all the pressure back on me and leaving you completely into the void here because I'm gonna lead the audience into the new topic, so you can take a sip of water. Uh, but I'm also right, go for it. insulting myself um, because I'm not prepared to segue with this. Um, so every single MSP, every single business has vendors. Uh, even it is like that you live with them, you work with them, you operate with them, you blacklist them. Uh, and it is a super critical part to partner with vendors so that you can be successful in your business. So how do you, being CTO of your company, go about checking, evaluating, and verifying a vendor can not only solve the problem, because obviously that's generally number one. You don't want to talk to them. They can't solve the problem. But vet that they can assist you when problems arise or their solution doesn't work as advertised and any other process that makes sure that they're a good fit for your company. How do you do that? Because that's the secret sauce that everyone wants. So I'm going to ignore your question first. I mean, I'm going to pick on something that you said. Uh, you mentioned I blacklist them, right? I just said blacklist. Only... I didn't say you blacklisted. Yeah, okay. The only reason why I agreed to this is so that I can finally clear the air on this rumor that goes around. This that is I your blacklist press conference. Vendors. You're press conferencing right this now. This is my press conference speech. I do not blacklist vendors. I am entirely vendor neutral until they have a, give me a reason not to be. Um no, I'm just kidding. That wasn't I'm not ignoring the question. Let me let me go back. What was the question again? Let me let me open up the recording. Uh no, the question how you, was how, do, how do we them? select vendors? Yeah. Right? How do you, you know, how do obviously, you what questions do you ask to verify they can solve your problems and make sure they're a fit for your company and will work? Yeah, there is a ton of resources online for 
that provide you templates on how to do vendor selection. Here's the thing, and, and the, the, the problem is, is that vendor selection is only now becoming a talked about problem. I shouldn't say only now becoming a problem. It's now becoming a talked about problem because of security. But in reality, it should have been something everyone was doing from the beginning. Because from a security perspective, you're vetting your vendor to make sure that they're secure and that uh, it doesn't in increase or decrease your risk or any risk that does do is mitigated as much as it can be. But in reality, the process is something that should have been happening for a while because it's not just about security. I, I say that, then I'm going to contradict myself in a little bit, but it's not just about how secure they are and, and how reliable they are. It's also um, how much value they bring to you, to your organization. And people have been doing subconsciously, oh, how much do you cost? Oh, how much can I sell it for? Uh, when my customers buy it, okay, cool, let's sell it, right? That's like a poor man's version of a vendor selection assessment just there. But in reality, you have there's more things to think about. You have to understand how they're able to support the product, right? When there's a problem, are they going to be there when you call when you call them, or are they just not going to show up, or what? You know, like are they if your customer that you've sold the product to is having an issue, are you going to be left holding the bag, or is the vendor going to be behind you, taking care of it? And if you don't know what their support SLA is like, if you haven't tested it, if you haven't tried reaching out to their support, people are like, oh, how's your support? Oh, great. Okay. So you don't mind if I test it? Like it's a joke. It's not a joke. Call up, make a ticket, pretend it's critical. It doesn't matter and see how they respond. Um, because they're, how they can support you is going to be uh, important. And if they can't respond when you're in sales, then there's no way that you're going to respond when you're a customer. So that's one thing. The other thing that we think about, and again, we're going back to security. And the reason why I said we're going to contradict ourselves is because, or I'm going to kind of contradict myself is because in reality, anyone who knows how security works, they understand that security covers not just protecting the data, it's also making it reliable and also making it available as needed. And unfortunately, support falls into reliability and availability, um, which falls into security. So it, it is all kind of security, but no one really addresses it as such. Um, so you want to look at the vendor, and especially these days when compliance is the next big buzzword that no one's calling a buzzword, you have to know that the vendor is going to be there, like I said, you have to know they're going to support you. You have to know how they protect your data. You have to know how the vendor is going to interface with your systems. So, I mean, what are we talking about? What kind of products are we dealing with? What information are they going to have access to? Right? It's not just about cost and whether or not you can sell it in value. You have that too, but you have to know if they get compromised, how can that impact us? Well, if it's a system that's integrated to other systems, one compromise can lead to another compromise. If that system, if either one of those systems contains information that's private, PII, then you have a bigger problem on your hands. If you're required and obligated to follow PCI compliance or HIPAA compliance or any of the other compliances, GDPR, especially in Europe, um, then you have, you know, you have to know what's going on and how that can impact you. And that's what we call risk. The mitigation to the risk is going to be based off how they respond. Yes, they have a risk because they have all of our data or access to all of our data. How do they protect that data? Have they gone through SOC 2 type 2 uh, audit, even though it's kind of useless? The fact that they've done it, and if they can provide the report, which you can get um, usually under NDA, then you can include that as a mitigation to the risk and say, yes, they have this data, but they're also this level of secure. You have these questions that, especially now, we're all filling out for cyber insurance. Do they have MFA on their email accounts? Ask the same question to your vendors. Do you have M MFA on your email accounts? Do you have remote access to your systems? Do any of your agents have access to my data without my authorization? These are questions that when you think about, they will come naturally to you. 
Also, in case you're going to miss something, like I said, there's online templates that you can get. There's hundreds of them <laughs> that you can get, you can look at and build questions that you would want to know. And you don't have to make their life difficult. Um, I remember in the early days when we were getting self-assessments, it was like a 300 line spreadsheet of the questions. And it wanted like detailed answers on each tab. And uh, what the heck is this? It's going to take us what 80 hours just to get through this one workbook um, for this one client. And then we'd have to do it each time for different clients. Like it, it was crazy. You don't have to make their life miserable. You just have to cover the areas that are the, the biggest risk. problem. Yeah. The biggest problem for your risk to help mitigate that to where it becomes acceptable to use them. And you'll be surprised at how things integrate with it, with everything. Like uh, if you have a vendor who integrates with your PSA system via API, how are they doing that? What permissions are they requiring? Um, yeah. Especially what, if your PSA system integrates with your RMM. Yeah. What, uh, what systems does that API permission allow for <laughs> access to? Do you fully understand how that works? Um, is it limited to one thing or is it have basically you give it access to ticketing and then it has access to every single ticket, including company and contact information and data like that? Is that um, included in that permission asset, even though you don't want that permission? Like there's, there's, you have to follow the rabbit trail to figure out where it ends up so that you understand where your own risks are. Um, I mean, we found, you know, at our company, a, one of our tools was not failing properly when it didn't match something in the system and it <laughs> created brand new companies in the system. And it's just like, why? <laughs> uh, and causing, you know, issues. And so we remove that permission set and it can no longer make companies even if it doesn't match anything and we deal with that on a different process like there's there's stuff like that that happens constantly that you have to just look out for and go through um and follow the breadcrumbs um they, they'll lead you to where you need to go when it comes down to it it's about it's this it's like this it, it's a simple concept where it's your business at risk and if you don't understand what's going on at a business, then you either don't care about it or your own business, which obviously you do because it's yours, <laughs> or you're being negligent. And you, you shouldn't be doing either one of those. <laughs> you know, you, you need to understand everything that's going on in your business because it's your business. You have to understand what is happening. And if you don't understand what the vendor is doing, or how the vendor is interacting with your business, then you are missing a key point. It's the same thing as like, oh, I don't know what this sentence means in this contract, but I don't care because I'm going to sign it anyways. No one signs a contract with something that they don't understand. It's the same kind of it's the same kind of idea. This includes... You have to understand how the vendor has access to your system and what they're doing in order for you to agree to work with that vendor in your MSP. This includes big vendors like Microsoft, Apple, absolutely, Salesforce huge vendors. absolutely this is the problem that we had with uh solar winds <laughs> right now everyone was using solar orion. winds and orion and before you know it <laughs> they had a supply chain uh compromise and everyone including government and microsoft <laughs> boom so yeah. the only other thing i'm going to say about vendor selection aside from risk assessment and mitigation and checking support works and everything like that is something that comes out of my recent deep dive into leadership and business mindset that I'm currently going through. And we all, anyone who does an interview with people with for new workers and new employees, one of the most common questions that you ask are like, what are your interests? What are your core values? Right? What are you really checking for when you're doing that? You're making sure that the person you're adding to your team aligns with who your company is. Right? No one ever wants to hire someone who's going to be the exact opposite of what your company core values are. Because when you do that, you're basically telling everyone who interacts with that person who's representing your company that you don't really stand by your core values. No one's going to, so you, you don't want that. You're going to be vetting the employee you hire to meet or match or align with your core values. That's just normal these days. 
I would argue that with vendors, you want the same thing. Because what's going to happen, whether or not you white label them, you are recommending them to your client. And if they cannot stand up to your core values, then your client is now being treated with service that's less than what you would want to give. So having that alignment with the vendor and discussion, how do you treat your customers? What happens if this situation were to occur? How would you respond in this situation? Why, did, why are you even in the business? Why, why did you create your product? What are your core values? You know, Having that discussion with the vendor allows you to learn more about the vendor than you would probably ever think to know. <laughs> And it may give you more information to either say, yeah, I want to work with them or no, I don't want to work with them because, you know, they're not the right kind of vendor. And there are a lot of vendors. There are a lot of vendors. So many vendors. Um, there's very, there's going to be a very rare chance uh, that you'll be working with a vendor, talking to a vendor about buying their products to give, to service your clients that you won't have a competing vendor with. Um, everyone is going to be checking those boxes, those stock two boxes, those support boxes. Everyone knows that's what sells. What they don't know is can they match up with your core values? Because that's something only you know, and they can't prep for. Right. And no one knows, everyone knows how to talk the talk, right? Yeah. You, you have to check to make sure they're actually walking the walk. Yes. Right. So it's not just a matter of like, oh, do you care about your customers? Yeah, no, of course I care about my customers, right? right? No, that's not going to help. You're not going to get anything knowledgeable out of that. You have to, okay, can I talk to references from your customers, right? Are there, are there customers of yours that I can, that I can talk to? Are there, um, how would you react in this situation? And in some cases, I absolutely run them through a fire drill without telling them, <laughs> oh, we have a customer doing this right now. We sell them your product. They're, they're doing, this is happening. What can we do? And see how they react. You know, if they can withstand those tests and they prove themselves as someone who stands with you, then they are a vendor to partner with. And that's the key is partnership. From both perspectives, not just one perspective. Absolutely. Like marketing is all about partnerships. And that's not true. You're still a customer. Always verify that partnership goes both ways. Yeah, I mean a partnership in its truest sense. Yeah, I know. But I'm clarifying uh, because it is nothing but marketing right now about let's build partnerships. We want to be your partner. Yeah, it's true. So we've selected a vendor. We're using the vendor. Do you... Would you recommend evaluating the vendor on a different, like a, almost cyclical? Like, would you check every year to make sure that the vendor you've selected still matches with what you do and still effectively solves the problem you were hiring them to do? A uh, vendor assessment is something that never stops happening and should be done with every interaction you have with that vendor. That's the truth. Now, a full assessment should be done on a recurring basis. Even from a compliance standpoint, you kind of have to. But in terms of, oh, do we align your, with your core values? Yeah, they checked the box. So now are they good forever? No, they're not good forever. They have to keep proving themselves. It's much like leadership and building trust. It takes consistent a showing over time that they're actually there for you. And in the event, here's the worst part is that in the event they aren't suddenly for whatever reason, right? You have to be willing and able to stand up for your core values for your clients. And that means potentially looking somewhere else if you have to. If, there's, if they're not able to provide a service that you need, and if they're not able to provide a level of service that you need or that you're telling your clients you're gonna get, you're almost required ethically to be looking at another company. You can't in good conscience continue with a company that is not able to fulfill the promises that you've made. And the worst part is, is that you have so much time and effort and energy and money sunk into this client. Maybe they'll fix it. 
you need to have a deadline. If it's not fixed by the end of the year, when it comes time for your re review, we need to start assessing a new client, a new vendor. So this is not about any specific vendor chat. <laughs> this is just in general. Oh, I thought they were talking about V Kyle specifically. You, you, no, V Mindy <laughs> Online is what we're talking about. Oh, V Mindy Online. Oh, yeah. V is Mindy that still Online. open? <laughs> it is still open. Um, so there are core business aspects. Like, <clears throat> let's take Microsoft, for example. Microsoft has 99% market share, right? For e online mail. Um, these are hard statistics that I got from the internet. It's definitely true. So, um, you should be evaluating as if they're so they're obviously the they're the biggest mail carrier you utilize them you resell them big vendor do you think it's valuable to look at other vendors who also do email in this space just to make sure that your vendor you've selected and chosen uh every year every three years however you feel you know time has gone by to develop in the the environment um, to check and make sure that your vendor is still innovating the way it needs to be. Do you think that's a valuable thing? Even if it's just a spend a day, evaluate all of them, and then, you know, that's it for the year or the next three years. Do you think that's valuable to make sure that your business is still competing with the vendors it's chosen to partner with? Um, it's going to depend on the vendor and the products that you're talking about. Right now, there isn't really any real, there is not any real contenders for Microsoft 365. I agree. Um, which is annoying because I personally can't stand them. <laughs> and if there was a vendor that came out that was able to check all the boxes and was able to also provide, the biggest thing that we're missing with Microsoft right now is they don't align with our core values. We don't have a real partnership. It doesn't feel like it anyways. We have nobody to talk to. Um, it's all through third party people and they basically do what they want with no guarantees. But they're also the only player in town providing a service that you have to have. So, so what constitutes a good vendor relationship to you? What would you consider a good, a good vendor relationship? To vendor relationship? Um, open communication is one thing. Being able to have a conversation with someone at the company who has the power to adjust, pivot, or address concerns that significantly impact your business. It doesn't have to be a small company. It can be a big company, but you have to have an account manager, account representative, or someone in that organization who's able to stay agile for the needs of your business. Because if they can't, then in reality, you don't have a partnership. You have, you are hanging on by a thread and they're taking you on for a ride, <laughs> which is what we have right now with Microsoft. <laughs> so let's, let's bring it down a notch. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a vendor. I have built a product to grow trees really efficiently. I am now the best in my space because Omni I can grow vendors or trees as efficiently as I can. You buy my product to grow your trees, your apple trees, whatever it is. Uh, I don't want to call it any specific vendor, so I'm building a vendor scenario here. Yeah, okay. Um, <coughs> it's been three years. I'm still providing you the same service. But obviously, things have been improved in the tree growing market. Technology's improved. It's I mean, you're moving to the cloud with your tree growings, uh, <laughs> shared farmland tree growing. Um, I provide share plotter land for you to grow your trees. Uh, would you? Where everything is good. You, I'm. You want trees grown? I grow your trees. Everything's fine. Would you reevaluate our relationship, even if everything's fine? At any point. So there's, there's two things. You're, mm -hmm. There's a reevaluation of the relationship, which happens all the time. And there's the result of that reevaluation. 
All right. So again, so the assessment, the evaluation of are we still a good fit happens all the time. But the history that you build counts for something. Right? You are a partnership. There's a relationship there. It helps. So let me ask you, Kyle, CEO of Kyle Trees. Best tree growing business in the world. Are you still available for when I have an issue? Yeah. And I can only grow apple trees. trees. Okay. And am I in any other business other than apple trees? The market's moving towards the other tree business, but I can only grow apple trees. So the question is that whether or not my business can stay with apple trees or whether or not I also have to pivot towards more than just apple trees. So in this scenario, the entire market is clamoring from fruit providers such as yourself, other fruits. Okay. So I would then assess, I would have to assess, there's no question, I would have to assess bringing in another vendor for more than just apple trees. And the question becomes is, how much of the lion share is apple trees and how much isn't? And what kind of relationship am I going to have with the other vendors? If the other vendors, and this is where, this is the key thing is like, if a vendor who has you, if you're, you have a partnership with a vendor and they add a product to their list, even if it's a competing product, even if they're like 10 years late, they add a value to the, to the product that you didn't have before, but other people have, right? You, uh, me as an MSP are more likely to stay with the vendor I'm with already and use mm -hmm. their feature set then I am to build a new relationship and grab the, the feature set from someone else because I already have a relationship. I don't want to maintain two of them. That's fair. Right. That's how it works. So um, in this case, you're talking about, I would ask you, Kyle, do you have any intention of doing, I don't know, some other, what other trees exist? Rolling out blueberry bushes next month. Blueberry bushes. Okay. So next month you're rolling out blueberry bushes and I would say, well, that's good for me. Uh, my customers want blueberry bushes and I can keep them happy, then I would probably stay with your vendor, with you as a vendor, because of that relationship that I already have and because it satisfies the need that I have. If it doesn't satisfy the need, I have to bring somebody else in, right? And if that somebody else builds a relationship with me and also provides the services you're already providing to me, then I'm sorry, Kyle, you're probably not going to remain a vendor of mine for very long. It's fair. I'll just, I'll just, maybe I can grill <laughs> illegal narcotics. Maybe I can move into that business. Colorado is available yeah. for actual trees. Um, I mean that's that's fair. That's that's all you want, right? You, I'm with you. I agree. Business. Uh, it's a, it's a relationship. If you have a good, comfortable relationship with someone who's providing you a product and or service, you want to maintain that relationship. There's no reason to leave it unless it's no longer satisfying your needs. All right. Need drives where the relationship goes. Everything else around it is what keeps the relationship going and happy. So need drives the relationship. Everything else around it continues the right. need. Yeah. If you're not satisfying the need, then there's not much we can do. <laughs> I feel like there's a Unless sex I'm joke willing to give somewhere. up my business. What? I feel like there's a sex joke in, in all we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Satisfied needs and I, I tell I tell vendors all the time, like I you know, I, I put in so much time. I talk to support, I talk to developers, I put in a ton of time giving them ideas, testing beta stuff, um, you know, describing how to fix what's broken or, or how to improve even if it's not broken, how to improve it um, to help expand their product. And the reason why I do it, I tell them like, listen, it's just like as a leader and coworkers and workers, right? Their success is your success. So here's a good question. Yeah. If need drives the relationship, how are you tracking today's need versus tomorrow's need? It's based off of the same, what, what do you want to call it? Sentiment? The customer's needs drives your needs, which drives the vendor's needs. Yeah, but the customer, I tell what the customer needs. I tell them what they need, and then they don't buy it. Um, that's a whole different conversation that you're diving into. 
I don't yeah, know if I you know. realized or not. I 100% <laughs> so, I'm, I'm aware. That is an entirely different conversation. It, it, it doesn't matter where the needs, who's telling them what the needs are. In the end, it's the customer's needs which drives your needs. If the customer needs a cloud directory, right, and Azure doesn't exist yet, and one login is still, you know, being born. Octa, Octa is maybe coming out. Jump Cloud was first, right? If Jump Cloud is the only solution, and the customer needs a cloud directory, then that's where you're going. Even if you're the one to tell the customer that they need a cloud directory because they're all remote employees, and they have no VPN set up or no server or anything like that, then it's still your. It's still the customer's need, and that's still what's going to drive your need. You need to have a relationship with Jump Cloud. So that you can, you know, provide that service to the customer because they need it. <laughs> so you find that uh, Octa is finally out, and their product is way better. And you're like, Octa is so much better; it's cheaper. We're being vendor neutral, so I know, but I just felt like going on with this scenario <laughs> because you you jump cloud. I don't know. I, I like this is new to me. I didn't know jump cloud was first. Yeah, I actually I made that up. I have no idea if it's real or not. I just know that <sighs> from my trees. perspective, it's the oldest one there. But I really have no idea. The people chatting can tell you if that's true or not. Um, so basically, I know Azure wasn't first. And if you try if you try Googling Azure Cloud Directory, you're going to end up with Jump Cloud number one on Google. Um, Blueberry Cloud. Oh, I remember <laughs> was it Blueberry Enterprise Solve Server BES? You had to have it installed. Blackberry Enterprise yeah, Server. Blackberry. <laughs> Blueberry. I'm selling bushes. Back to the bushes. <laughs> I, I'm trying to. Oh, I got There's a market out there, Mindy. I'm trying to. Yeah. <laughs> trying, I'm trying to, to sell capitalize. your trees and bushes. I got it. It is. Yeah. Weird. It's 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 the need that drives the direction of where you're going to go, and then anything after that is going to be well. You meet the need, but are you secure? Can you protect us? Can you protect yourselves? Can you provide us the level of service that we need, the reliability that we're looking for? Yeah, you, you start checking the boxes. Right. And you find the one that checks the most boxes that fits more in line with your core values than anyone else. Exactly. You start determining which one fits better. So we've selected our vendor. We've <laughs> uh, evaluated our trees. You've decided my trees are okay for now. You're going to buy a blueberry bush vendor till the time's up or whatever. Um, how much effort do you, so you've decided to leave my tree company. How much effort do you put into maintaining this relationship? Like you've decided to leave. How do you handle that process? You no longer want my trees. You're going to go to my neighbor, uh, Ashley's tree emporium. Um, who I was has, wondering who you're gonna pick? Who has apple, orange, and lemon <clears throat> trees? You've decided they fit your needs better. Yeah. You. I'm gonna call you up. If we've have a personal relationship, I'm gonna call you. You're my friend. You don't walk away. I had um I had a guy who left, and I, I he did not work with me. We weren't in the same company. We talked a lot because of work because we, we were forced to interact in certain situations. And when he left his job, he called me up to warn me. Hey, Mendy, I just want to let you know, I'm leaving my job. I haven't told anyone else yet. We've talked all the time. We're friends. I'm, about, I'm going to go give my notice right now. And you probably won't hear from me because we won't have any reason to interact except for in specific, whatever, certain uh, like random friendly Hey, what's up chats? You know, like there won't be a, like a weekly communication anymore due to work. It's, it's going to be the same thing. You have a vendor that you have a relationship with. You're no longer going to be talking to them all the time. <laughs> it's not a matter of, Oh, I'm not paying you anymore. So now I don't have to talk to you. You're I'm going to call you up and say, Kyle, you know, I'm first after this is after months. Again, we are reassessing on a, on an annual basis. Let's say Kyle, the year's coming up and I've got six months left and I need orange and lemon trees and your neighbor is looking really good right now, but <laughs> you know, I, six months, I can't maybe. get it I need you. six months, <laughs> you know, roadmap in two weeks. Sorry. Was that too much? <laughs> I'll build a new roadmap, literally an actual road with a map on it. 
yeah. to my trees from the ground up the tree okay um you moving, went at a different direction on. than i went <laughs> um i'm gonna call you up and i'm gonna tell you what's going on and i'm gonna give you warning and notice and i'm gonna beg and plead and say i don't want to cancel this relationship we're friends i like working with you you do everything i want when i say it i can't get that anywhere else yet <laughs> You know, there's a there's a struggle to disconnect there because you're breaking ties. And I'm going to try, which is why, like I said, I, I work with support and developers and I test their beta products and I try to get them to make it work because I don't want to have to go find another product. You know, the, I'm talking to people who I've already gone through several leaps and bounds to get a hold of. I've already built that relationship. I don't want to have to start over again. If I go to a different product, I'm doing it all over again. So... So I'm going to call you up and I'm going to plead and beg and go up on a hill to die. And in reality, whatever happens, happens. If you come up with the trees, then we're going to stay. And if you don't, we're going to part on hopefully amicable terms. And, you know, I'll invite you to the holiday party still. And if you come to me and say, hey, Mindy, uh, trees weren't doing it for me. You know, my neighbor kind of stole my seeds <laughs> from under me. <laughs> Now we're building walls to protect the trees. How, how would you like a wall? Yeah, sure. I know you. The relationship's there. You're giving me a new value, a new product that I need. You know, I, it may not be company. a need. <laughs> it may not be a need that I can that I know about. I might not realize the need until you present it to me. Right? Yeah. When you come to me and say, hey, I, I, I'm selling walls to protect fences or whatever, to protect your, your gardens and trees, I can go back to the customer like, hey, guess what? Hey, you know how you keep uh, getting fruit stolen or you bad, know, animals bad keep apples. getting in? Just say bad apples. Bad apples. There you go. You know, like, <laughs> um, I can give you a wall and we can protect you, your trees. We can protect the bad apples from the bad apples. We can protect <laughs> you from the bad apples. Come on, Mindy. That's where it was going. Anyways, we can protect you from the bad apples. Um, okay. So that need is now created. The customer goes, hey, I need that. That's good. I need that. Now they have that need you just created, and their need drives your need, which drives the vendor's need. So let's let's back up a little bit. Sure. I know you have a blacklist. Everyone knows you have a blacklist. <laughs> now, who's on that blacklist? I thought and we how addressed you, this already. Hold in on. My and how you get on that blacklist. Conference could vary person to person and depending on who's exaggerating that particular time. But you do have a blacklist. <clears throat> I think the answer is, Kyle's. everyone should have a blacklist. And I don't even know what I was going to ask. It's not a... Oh, I'm assuming so who's on there. your blacklist or how do you build your blacklist or why did you build your blacklist or anything like you, that. You're fine. Fill, okay. uh, fill in the question. Do my job for me. All right, cool. I think everyone should have a blacklist and it's not about... It's not a, like there's three sides, at least three sides to everything in life, I like to say, but because sometimes there's way more, but usually you can start with three. And in this case, there are the vendors that are good, that check all your boxes. They align with your core values. You want to do business with them. You build a great relationship and they're your go-to vendors. Then you have the vendors that don't check your boxes. Okay. Uh, maybe they don't have a good answer for why they're not compliant with any kind of regulation. Or maybe they don't have a good answer on what security they do or why their people can log into your system without authorization. Or maybe they have all of that, but they don't align with their core value. And they say, you know, it's more important for me that my product uh, gets visibility than it is that it works. You know, it, maybe that could be one of their core values and that could be a problem for you. But it's not a problem. That's not a reason to check a black box. Checking a black box is when the vendor does something that goes not for and not neutral, but directly against what you stand for and what you want to see and how you believe what you believe is right in the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if you have uh, a vendor, let's say in the security space, there's hundreds of thousands of vendors now in the security we space. We have a wall right? protecting my apples. <laughs> let's say that uh, one of the vendors 
in that space was selected to give a presentation. In not anything related to their product, just in general, securing trees with walls. And they get up there and say, hey, guess what, guys? Yeah, you know, security is a problem and we want to build your walls and protect the trees. But really what you need is you should buy my product where we can run electrical wires up your tree and we zap anything that touches your tree. And it's absolutely a surefire way of making sure that we protect everything and you don't even need the walls. <laughs> and they spend so much time. They have, they're given an hour to speak. And this is an example where instead of, instead of taking action towards the community, let's say, or doing what they're, they, they put their own interests and it's not even putting them above, like I can't even describe the level of how far away from the request they did. Like they, they don't even care what they were asked to do. They care about getting their point across. Um, they sacrifice honesty, integrity, to make the sale. And that's an example of a vendor who would check the black box because it's not that they're neutral. They're not neutral. They're very much bad because they're, they are willing to lie, misrepresent, or over promise mm -hmm. in order not to get correct the their behavior. goal. I think that's a, and not correct the behavior. I think that's part of the thing. Because you'll always well, have rogue elements who will do stuff like that. But at that point, if they're in this scenario where they're giving us a presentation on it, someone's vetted that presentation. Someone's allowed that to go forward. That means that type of behavior is allowed. Well, in this case, encouraged. we're talking about we're talking about the CEO <clears throat> doing it. So right, it's one, we're not one, naming one things, vendor. Mindy. One person <clears throat> vendor. The only thing is he's the CEO. Like that's just the example. Um, there's one person in the vendor company, he's the CEO. So yeah, obviously you don't want to paint the entire picture with the same yeah. color. What's the, what's the saying? Paint you don't everyone use... with the same brush or something like that. Just because one person is screwing up doesn't mean you get to blame the whole company. Unless there's a one person company. Unless it's a one person company. Exactly. Then you can. What you want to do them. and as part of your selection and vetting process is to make sure if you are seeing this, I mean, you're not obligated to do it because in the end, like it's your decision who you want to go with and you can absolutely be turned off by just one person. But just because one person does something bad doesn't mean the whole company is bad. And what you really need to do if you want to blacklist the company is ensure that really that company deserves being blacklisted. So escalate. Hey, can I talk to someone else? I don't like your tone. No one said you have to be polite. <laughs> it's not like they were polite to you. I mean, it depends on what scenario this is. Like, you should try to be polite where it's you allowed. You should be professional. There you go. Absolutely. That, I'm okay with that. Right? But look, if they're wasting your time, you don't have time to waste. We already discussed that back in, in before in leadership, right? Your your time is, time is limited. <laughs> right. So if they're wasting your time, I, I don't I don't really want to talk to you. Can I talk to someone instead? I like your product. I, I'm thinking about it. But I don't like you. And I mean, see where that gets you. We've had that issue before as a company. <laughs> Our uh, liaison was changed to a liaison that wasn't very beneficial. We requested a new liaison and got our old liaison back. Yep. We had our account manager changed. And... Uh, the new account manager reached out and said, "Hey, we want what? Look at look in the geek cast channel." Yeah, I, I, I laughed. Ray, I, I laughed at that. Um, but you know, I actually don't. I actually don't like that show. <laughs> but still, it it's matter. weird seeing my own face on the on the picture. Um, anyways, <laughs> uh, we had an account manager. The things were moved around. He was moved out of our account manager. We got a new one. Uh, one of my guys reached out to the new one and said, hey, we're looking to decrease costs any way you can help. And they're like, sure, we can increase your price. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? That's not what we wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can decrease your per cost if you commit to a higher number, paying more money. Like, no, we want to pay less money. 
yeah, 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 no, we understand. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, uh, like, it, it was ridiculous. So we, uh, we escalated. <laughs> we escalated and we got the old account manager back and found out that actually our cost was higher than it should have been <laughs> initially. And we got that down. So we were, we achieved our goal. And we set out, we saw, we set out to solve a problem and we critically thought through the problem determined too expensive. And, and the vendor is still a current vendor of our company. They are. Uh, I would say we still have a good relationship with that vendor. I would say that too. I love that vendor. They're my favorite. So yeah, when you blacklist, you want to make sure the vendor actually deserves it. And the other thing is people, you have to remember that people change mm -hmm. and you have to be open. Culture to change too. Re cultures change, businesses change, yep. right? You have to be open to reassessing and seeing if they've improved or not. That's why I'm a proponent of reevaluating the market every yes. three years, I think is a good time. Um, depending on what segment of the market you're looking at. Uh, but on average, I'd say three years, the development timeline has significantly increased for features and integrations and abilities of products to allow you to make an actual decision on if, if you need to, if you need to start looking into reevaluating whatever relationship you're looking at. Because in three years, if there's been no progress to help solve your needs, then you can probably make a good determination if you need to evaluate. Yeah, and, I agree. Mindy, what color is that poster? Which one? The one in the that he posted, <coughs> Ray posted. It's not on screen anymore. I think Slack history is gone. It's not. Um, which part of the poster would you like me to tell you the color? Uh, oh. There's really only one color. Um, okay. Black and white uh, and gray are not the colors. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I see that. What's the it's other color that's mentioned? That's that's represented there. Yellow? It's not yellow. <laughs> it's red. Is it not yellow? No, it's red. 100% red. Which area are you talking about? All With of the it. background behind blacklist and stuff? Yes, all of it's all it's red. Is that really not yellow? No, it's red, black and white. I'm totally screwing with you. I know it's red. I know. <laughs> no, you can see red. That's one of the colors just, you can't I see. just wanted to see if I can keep the straight face through the whole thing. And apparently I made Ashley laugh, so that's a win. That's all that matters is making Ashley laugh. No one else. No one else matters. Uh, although evidently Kyle's are getting into the blueberry bush market. So uh, check out V Kyle. Virtualized for... blueberry bush market. <laughs> Virtualized blueberry bushes. Uh, <laughs> coming to a field near you. Um, Mindy can see red. That's why there's a Mindy list. <laughs> <coughs> Mindy, in a rough estimate, how many vendors are on your blacklist? Um, I don't know, twelve maybe. It seems like a lot, but based on the space we're in, that's not very many. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Surface level, that's a lot. It's really not that many. Okay, what if I change my company's name from Kyle Trees Limited to Kyle Tree, not Kyle Trees Limited? Am I now on your off your blacklist? No. Dang it. Because it, when we do the assessment, I'm going to run into the same problems. True. And again, I'm not like, just because you're on my blacklist doesn't mean I'm not going to assess you if you come back to me again. It's going to happen because I'm not closed minded and I think things can change. So uh, my first reaction, it's going to be a faster assessment. My first reaction is going to be, has anything changed from the last time I assessed you? That's going to be the real number yes, one question I'm going to ask. Of course. And if the answer is no. Well, I mean, you shouldn't ask that question. You should evaluate that question. Right. Well, if you when ask, I say ask me, me as you the ask yourself. <laughs> useful, beneficial salesperson, I'm always going to make sure that the answer is correct. Oh, well, yeah. We don't do that anymore. Really? Yeah. No, you should be asking yourself. Anytime you ask questions, by the way, I, I just said this yesterday to my team. When you ask questions, you should be asking yourself that question first. And only then... When you don't know the answer or can't find the answer yourself, do you go ask it for other people? <laughs> so I think we've discussed clients, vendors, uh, trees, and bushes uh, long enough. I think it now is the time 
to have a Q and or A session. So anyone who has questions, they want to ask the legendary Mindy Green. Uh, and he is legendary. Uh, he hand-built our Automate server from the ground up. Um, and then destroyed it. Uh, <laughs> and then rebuilt it again. Uh, so much so that I'm scared to even log into the server because I'm afraid I might get infected with something. We will need to just rekey the web service. That's all. No big You've deal. done way more than that. Let's not. Uh, why isn't V-Kyle bridged, Mindy? You've been the bridger. Because I feel like if we combine the collective minds of Kyle's across two channels, then we're going to end up with Borg. And I don't want to do that. What about the other channels that aren't bridged? Um, no one's tagged me in them to tell me to bridge them. So I uh, Okay. Uh, I will... If you I... tag me in every single channel telling me to bridge it, I will go bridge each channel that you tag me in. <laughs> every single viewer. Please, Every single, what? Oh, viewer, viewer, yeah. please <laughs> do your best and go and evaluate to see if every channel is bridged. And if it's not, specifically tag Mindy Green. <laughs> um, if you don't succeed, tags in, this, in V Kyle will be ignored. Uh, if he doesn't bridge V Kyle, I'll not bridge V Kyle. Be assimilated. <laughs> once I figure out the systems to do it. Um, what if your vendor acquires another company, rebrands that product, and claims it's a new product build from the ground up? Um, was that like a like a theoretical scenario? It's a, it's a question. That's just a question. <laughs> I've read from the chat. <laughs> um, I, there, there. Here's the thing: when you're doing assessments, is that there are parts of the assessment you're going to run against the product and there are parts of the assessment you're going to run against the company. And you don't want to mix that up, especially when you're dealing with a company that has more than one product line. So the value add is the security, things like that have to run against the product as well as the company. The relationship has to run mostly on the company, but also on how that company supports that, that product. product. Yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. Sometimes you have to separate marketing from real life. And it's not always the, like you have to peel back the marketing layers because marketing is in everything you do, everything you see, everything you're involved with. Someone's trying to sell you something and marketing, not everyone who is in marketing does this, but that's just a general aspect. Uh, they're trying to pitch it and trying to give you the person who's looking at whatever it is they're marketing to you a better example of why you should pick their product over someone else. Sometimes you're going to have to peel back to the marketing aspect to see the core values, the core product and the core company that they don't market. And that can be more beneficial than just evaluating the product. How many tags are you getting? Um, I had nine. You nine, had nine. Seven. Seven. Um, Lifecycle Insights is one that needs to be bridged. I'm pretty sure I did that one already. It's not. Okay, I'm at 11 now. <laughs> <laughs> well, 13. Can I get 15, guys? Give me 15. Get 15, get 15, get 15, get 15, get 15, get 15. Let me just, let me just. Again, clarify, if if Kyle comes to me six months later and says, hey, Mendy, guess what? I got blueberry bushes. You don't have to leave me, right? I'm not going to go, great, give me some, let's do it. That's not going to be my first reaction. My first reaction is, well, what are the quality of the blueberries you're giving me? That's going to be my first reaction. You have to make sure that you assess each product separately. It's going to be different. Just because it's part of the same company does not mean you're going to get the same quality that you're used to. In some cases... You will, and it's a bad thing, but that's a different story. <laughs> In those cases, you really should probably shouldn't be with them anyways, but... Evaluate to solve the problem that you have to fill the need. If that Each doesn't time fill the need... You're filling a need. Move on. Exactly. If it fills the need, then you begin the evaluation of the company and the product. There's no reason to, to start with why. 
unless you're Simon Sinek. I mean, you don't need to start with why. You already know why you're looking for a product. You have a problem. You need to solve it. (laughs) You need trees. (laughs) Um, But you should be evaluating if they solve the need. If you need apples and you're going to an orchard, you're not going to go to a lemon orchard to get apples. Right? You're going to be like, oh, that's a lemon orchard. I don't need lemons. I need apples. And you're going to move on. Now, if you need lemons, you'll be like, all right, let me look. Let me see if they grow good lemons. Let me see if the person who grows the lemons is on the up and up. Does he steal seeds from the black market that he stole from Kyle's tree emporium? I think my stock just crashed. Uh, they deserve it. <laughs> guys you have to realize like if i if you tag me in every channel even ones that are bridged because 90 percent of the ones you tag me in are bridged already i'm just gonna right click and just mark all as red and i'm not even gonna know what you hey, did Mindy? yeah what if the bridge is broken on those channels um are they oh, really? oh critical thinking but see that's you oh, gotta determine yeah. that you gotta find the information I'm Am still I being... gonna. I mean, I'm gonna check two or three of them, but then I'm just gonna right click and mark them all as red. The third Am channel I, being... I run into that's already working, I'm just gonna right click and mark all as red, and all that work will be lost. Did you think that's that through, or did you assume? Tags. Yeah, forty-one tags. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, guys. That's why we have. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. Um, Mindy, can you give some examples of what things that you would uh, immediately? shit list of vendor for lying straight up if if someone lies to me and is caught in the lie and then doesn't admit to it right dishonesty and it ha- it has to be constant dishonesty and then it and it has to come from the company not from the one person um so yeah uh asana it's a great product. We got with them. They're like, yeah, we'll give you this. And they quoted a price. I'm like, okay, we're ready to move forward. And the guy's like, well, I, I really can't give you that price I told you about. I'm, I'm really not authorized to do that. <laughs> but the price that they were offering after that was still reasonable. The product is still great. We still liked it. We don't use them anymore. We never signed. And we spoke to the person we're dealing with and their manager and everyone was like, yeah, sorry, we can't give you the price we're given. We had it in writing. Sorry, the guy wasn't authorized to give you that price. They were not willing to stand up behind their own people. They weren't willing to own up to the cost that they'd already given us. And it wasn't that big of a deal. Like it wasn't crazy expensive for us to be like, never mind, we can't, we can't afford that. It was, you don't care about your customers. You don't care about your employees to stand up behind them. You either tell them to offer a price to buy interest and then change it last minute. The entire thing just stank. And we were just so sorry, we're done. That's a good reason. I mean, you didn't have a name of vendor, but I'm okay with it. Yeah, I mean, it was a vendor that's not really in the space, I think. And if, I am, if I'm wrong, then I don't apologize for insulting anyone because in the end, you should change your business practices. <laughs> What if support, what if support lies? <coughs> they tried calling you. You didn't answer. They tried calling you. You didn't answer. There's no record on your end. It's a different, it's a different animal. Um, and again, support is part of the assessment that you deal with, right? Being able to support the product is important for you to provide value. If it doesn't matter how valuable it could be, if it doesn't work and you can't get it to work, then it's not actually valuable. And that's it's an ongoing like, estimation. That's not just a, I evaluated to begin with and that was good. Support is exactly. an ongoing evaluation. That's why I said evaluation, your customer, your vendor evaluation is something that you would be doing every interaction you have with them. Every time you interact with them, it's going to be, how do they do? How do they score? Did they successfully... Uh, line up with our core values. Have they lied this time? Does the product still work? Right? Every single interaction 
and the, each interaction, regardless, even if it's during the same, I had a, I had an accident with my car one time I was driving on an icy road and I fell off. And then within an hour, another car also fell off the area while I'm waiting for the tow truck, same exact spot spun off the road and slammed into my car and completely ruined the other side of my vehicle. And insurance is like, well, the incidents happened so close together. We'll just treat it as one incident. And because it's the other guy's fault, you don't have to pay the doctor. I'm like, okay, cool. Right. You don't do that here. <laughs> doesn't matter if it's one incident. Every interaction you have with each person is assessed separately. Right. Does the manager lie? Does the manager's manager lie when you try to get it work to trying to get their issue resolved or trying to get the price down or when you're trying to come up with a deal or put something together for the customer? Every interaction you have with each person lends to that assessment that you do. It doesn't have to be written down physically. It doesn't have to be a score you keep track of in a, sp in a spreadsheet that actually gives a weighted value. It's a feeling that you have when you talk to them. And at the end, you just put a yes or no down. And if you have enough no's, then hey, guess what? You're probably not dealing with the right vendor. And if you have enough yeses and only a couple no's, then, you know, the vendor is actually pretty good because everyone has a couple of bad apples. Yeah. That you need walls to protect yourself from. Exactly. You got to put the walls to protect yourself from the bad apples. Emotional walls, not physical ones. What about the electric thing for that? You get zapped if you touch my trees. What about the electric thing for that? We bought it. Okay. From the CEO who was giving that presentation. And? I'm in. No one's tried to climb my trees yet, but I'm waiting for it. My electric bill's gone up quite a lot, though. Are you leading to a question, or are you just telling a story? Just I'm speaking, as a host <laughs> should, just constantly. Just telling a story. Okay, I got it. No, it's cool. Um, <coughs> oh, my product is poised to upset the market. We build walls using building materials made from bad apples. That's genius. <laughs> That's, you know what? You're definitely going to upset something. I don't know if it's the market. Look, I'm I'm willing to sell my business to you. You can have the Apple market. It's done. You can, I'm, I'm out. I didn't innovate enough. I didn't even think of that. That's a genius idea. Let's take the bad apples, crush them down, and build a building material to protect. It's also completely organic. There you go. I just want to shout out to Jason Slagle, who's probably the only member of the community to pay attention to the vendor announcements channel. By the way, we have a vendor announcements channel. Um, they are legit announcements from vendors. They are useful. They're informative. Um, and if you'd like to interact with some vendors who maybe you don't want to interact with the channel, but you want to catch some announcements, I highly recommend you join <coughs> hashtag V vendor announcement events. You'll find it. It's there. Um, and if you haven't looked at the the channels, you can hit the channels. There's beside the channels button in Slack. You can hit the plus button and you can browse every single channel you're not a member of. Um, and that can be beneficial in case you find a vendor who's joined and you maybe missed the announcement of them being out. Um, they're really, there's some really cool vendors out in the Slack that have been uh, joining lately. Uh, v Kyle is there always uh, represent. Um, Mindy online is going to die. Yeah, it's going, it's going away. Is it bridged? No. <laughs> Someone tag him real quick. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I made that channel in discord. <coughs> it's very funny. Um, yeah, is there, there, we're open to any questions. If anyone has any, we'll answer. I'll answer any question. I got no shame. Some vendors. Okay, so there are new vendors that haven't been announced yet because we haven't done a major announcement. Back up. Well, you also don't want to just spam announcements to people either. Why is Mindy better than Kyle? Uh, that's an easy question. Uh, Mindy is light years better than me, and it is a pleasure working with Mindy uh, on a daily basis. I'm just going to uh, repeat what I said at the beginning. Any skill that you think I have, I don't actually have. It's all from critical thinking. That's the only skill I have. And I wouldn't even call it super critical thinking. You're right. It'd be extreme critical thinking. <laughs> 
you'd be on one of those game shows where they'd be like critical thinkers like the ninja what's that ninja where you get regular people where you have to do ninja task they would just put things in front of you and you'd critically solve them that'd be you and you'd win easily you'd be the number one you'd be the jeopardy champion uh who is currently leadership or strategist positions starting at one set are hiring for those positions not me you let me know if you find anyone who's looking for a leader or strategist for 170k a year just give them my phone number <laughs> i've got some brown on my nose uh i just want to point out that i have like 40 something tags in discord in discord even better because they're already all bridged <laughs> Um. Yeah, but I don't want to have to go find them, Ray. Send them to me. Headhunt me. There we go. Yes, I'm. I'm not lazy. I just want to feel wanted. Mindy's always better. I will never not refute that fact. I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you can, Mindy can try to refute that fact, but that's just his introvertedness speaking. Unless you get him upset. Man, you get Mindy upset and it is possibly, it's, it's better than watching The Bachelor. <laughs> Yeah, The Bachelor. You know, the trash TV. I don't know what you're talking about. What sacrifices have you have have your organizations made recently due to supply chain shortages? We've told our clients it's gonna take longer to get their product. Us? Ourselves, you're saying? I guess. I don't I don't know what we don't we haven't the only supply chain shortages we've had are just getting product in and we've just pushed it back. Oh, no, we've done some shit. We've done some crazy stuff. Yeah, I don't really. Go ahead. Spill the beans. Um, well, we've bought switches on Netgear, on, on, from Netgear on eBay, what I meant to say. We bought like S3300s on eBay. We've been like stockpiling them up and paying ridiculous prices just so that we can have them, uh, just in case. Netgear's our stack. Don't hate. Netgear is one of our stacks. Yep. Yeah. The S3300 series, those things go on forever. And there are 10 gig switches and stack Left across warranty. fiber and cat six A and cat five E even sometimes with left time warranty. So yeah, absolutely. They're part of our stack. They're great switches. Um, and we've paid a ridiculous amount on eBay for some of them just so we can have them, especially the POE switches. Uh, we have a lot of nursing homes that deal with many kiosks. And unfortunately, kiosks are not available. We have come up with some ridiculously creative ways to build kiosks for them that we would never do normally. And because of the fact that A, we don't build computers and B, we can't really support them as much as well. Um, but we did it anyways, because they needed it. And uh, we've broken our no Chromebook policy as well, just to help with supply chain. Like there's, it's been rough. Those are sacrifices that we've made to our policy, our support methods. We've overpaid, we've overpaid for equipment that we know we're not going to sell at that rate. Um, I think that's about it. We've eight costs. We've eight costs, yeah, for sure. Um, do you have a good <laughs> example of a vendor being good and then coming off of your shit list? Um. Yeah, I guess so. Untangle. That was that was a that was a story. They went on your shit list real quick, <laughs> and then came back off of it equally as fast. Um, they tell the story. They had no support. Bottom line is like every time we've talked, and it wasn't fast that they got on their on the shit list. It was it was over a period of time. Um, I like the product. I use it for my own house, and we sold it a few times, and. In specific situations, I use it as well. They have, uh, we like in unique air situations where we've had, to, we've needed complicated configurations in the firewall. 
we were able to do them. In some cases, they would not work because of by design. In some cases, they would work and then they would break and then you reset it and it works again and then it breaks. There's a bug of some sort. And in, in three or four situations, it's happened. We've created tickets each time and tried working with their support. But their support team clearly did not understand the, the networking aspect. They just knew their product. They did not know actual networking. One of my biggest pet peeves when dealing with support is that you are supporting me. You have to know more than me when it comes to the area you're supporting. Um, and I understand that everyone needs their tier ones and that, and that, you know, but you have to be able to escalate. I was talking to tier two guys. They would not escalate and they just kept insisting I was doing it wrong. Um, and then they got confused when I threw out things like route-based instead of policy-based VPN stuff. So bottom line is, is that it just, it didn't work out. And I, we stopped selling them and I notified our account manager saying, Hey, your product's great. Your support sucks. Have a nice day. We're done. Um, I got the reason why they got off quickly was because I got obviously a phone call from, uh, it was within a week or two from the account manager, um, who basically informed me like they know about the struggle that, that with support. If it's something that they've been working on, they're building out a higher level of support with direct development, development access for partners or MSPs. Um, and in the meantime, I got two cell phone numbers that I can call 24 seven that would lend me in tier three or developer support if needed for specific situations. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I took them off the list. So we'll try it out, see what happens. And right now they're still not on the blacklist. Uh, Meta doesn't like that gear pro stage. Okay. Why not? Uh, I don't know. He's talking about toddlers and screaming. So <laughs> evidently he doesn't have a very good, uh, relationship with them at all. Um, I'm happy to bring him into this cast and have that out with him. I don't have that set up. We can't do that. <laughs> it would break literally everything because it would for reasons. I feel like as a vendor, you're not meeting my needs, Kyle. Luckily, I'm not your vendor. <laughs> pro safe firewalls. Maybe you meant pro safe firewalls. Oh yeah, no. Firewalls are no, no, ew. Now, specifically switches. And by the way, stay away from the wireless too. Just the S3300 switches or the M4300 switches. Those are the only two Netgear products that we and like. The M is the upgrade from the S, right? The M is the fully managed switch with CLI. The S is the smart switch. It's got a web UI only. Um Okay, I meant but, the the four three zero zero is the upgrade to the three three zero zero. The numbers are actually they're actually the same same thing. You can stack an M forty three hundred with an S thirty three hundred together, um, without a problem. But so yeah, I guess it's kind of the upgrade. But the important thing is the M versus the S. Uh, and then the numbers just denote the generation and and version, I guess. Um, so like one of the, one of the reasons why we like it is because you can stack up to six switches for on the M4 on the S3300 series, you can stack up to six switches across 10 gigabits, um, over 300 feet or so. Was it it's uh, up to 100 me. meters or something? I'm net plus certified and I still don't know how I got that. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, like I, I've talked to um, I've talked to networking guys and they're like, you're stacking switches across closets. <laughs> yeah, it's normal. We can do that with Netgear. You know, most switches you don't do that on. It's like, oh, uh, you don't ever want to stack across closet because you can't guarantee the quality of the connection or anything like that. They, some Most switches don't even support it. You have to be within a certain length. You have to use an HDMI cable. Um, so they're raging you know, at you already in chat. <laughs> They're freaking at me. Yeah, because you're you're stacking across closets. <laughs> we can stack across closets, guys, and it works. Okay, it works. It can get a little messy if it doesn't work, but it does work. 
And when it works, it's beautiful. We've had, uh, we've gone from the first floor to the fourth floor on Cat 5e. We plugged it in and watched it come up on 10 gig. We're like, oh, 10 gig connection, boom, stack it. And we've stacked the switches. We run a second cable and we have full redundant paths at 20, that's like, what is it, 15 gigabits that it runs at for the backbone between switches because it's like one and a half times the speed or something like that. Yep, no one likes you right now. They're all complaining about uh, how you shouldn't do this. Uh, and uh, um, just because anyone you can wants totally to see means you should. What, anyone who wants to see Avic on my on these networks, hit me up. And I will show you in private because I can't show it in public. The bandwidth that's put, that's being pushed through these switches and the level of uptime that they've had and the level of service that they get. It works and it's cool. Uh, someone wants you to cut the stack cable. <laughs> I think that would kind of defeat the purpose because if you cut the stack that. cable, then you cut the stack cable. Like that's, it's just really long stack cable. Uh, they want to, uh, Meta wants another strobe rate of the activity LED. <laughs> one of the things that drives us crazy, by the way. What is the, the, one of the most common symptoms that you can use to, de to determine whether you have a network loop is by looking at the lights, right? The activity lights of the LED on the switch. If they're all blinking in unison, likely there's some sort of storm going on, right? With these neck hairs, they're always, always blinking in unison. <laughs> so it's like, wait, is there something wrong or is there not something wrong? And you can never really tell based off the LEDs. It's annoying, but we got over it. Slaggle is the one specifically raging at you, by the way. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Along with uh, Ray, who's also a network engineer. Uh, he said, do not do this. Um, they, they're, they're revolt. There's pitchforks, Mindy. They're getting them out. They've they've locked, opened the case where the pitchforks are that they've sharpened. Um, they just happen to be sharpened, not for this specific instance. But um, it's not looking good for you, bud. That's okay. I think I'll survive. Night Rider LEDs for the win. It's accurate. How many tags do you have, Mindy? Uh, right now, 39. And I've clicked on like 10 of them. So it's gone up. By the way, the M4300s, you can stack with more than just two cables. You can stack with every single 10 gig connection. So we have in one area, we have an, a warehouse. We have two M4300 switches that are on opposite sides of the warehouse. And we have six fibers that go between. Fiber we stacked. SFPs? Yes, SFP plus. We've stacked six SFP plus connections. a 60 gigabit LA, uh, stacking connection from one to the other. And then on each end, we have multiple Dell stacked switches. Um, that connect to the neck ear core switches, I guess, over LACP. Um, and that's how the warehouse connects to each other, one side to the other. See, all, you're all wrong, chat. You all can't you. do that with, net, with with standard networking stuff. Most switches won't let you do that. Yeah, Mindy's right, you're wrong. He critically thought it. Expertly critically thought it. Extreme, excuse me. Real stackable switches have dedicated stack ports. That is correct. They do. But they also don't go 100 feet or across closets or whatever. And some of those real switches with real stack ports are HDMI uh, ports, which are not very fast. Two and a half gigabits per second, I think. Is that right? I don't know. I can't see the Twitch. Real chat, stackable sorry. switches are use matched form factor, and those stack ports are integrated into the top and bottom to keep you from doing dumb shit like stacking across <laughs> racks. Uh, I would beg to differ because guess what? I have a switch. It physically exists and it's real and it does switching and it also stacks. Okay, here's on a question. Any for port you. that I want that's 10 gig. Is the neck your stack stacking virtual? And can you do M lag? 
um yeah you'd have to actually explain what those terms mean in mindy does a network acronym yeah I, in ways that i actually understand its function because terminology is different across vendors and i have no idea what you're what you mean by virtual stacking or what i'm lagging is slago wants to go on i have so many questions i need another person <laughs> box do you do a port channel across stack switches yes you can Yes, and we, we do it all the time for when we have stack switches with redundant paths in the same closet. Um, we want to connect to a, like a server. We lag across multiple switches uh, using LACP. I feel like we're getting more questions for the thing that wasn't meant to be part of the GeekCast than anything doesn't matter. else. I said Q but... and or A. It doesn't say GeekCast <laughs> specific future now Q and or A. I'm happy to keep going, guys. And if you can ask a question in a way that I can understand it, I'm happy can to Can you do a link ad group? Oh, what? Link aggregation group. Lags. That's the same thing as a port channel in Cisco Talk. Okay. I know so, what a lag is. Yes. Yes, you can do a lag or a port channel. Uh, across switches inside the stack. So you have the stack, when you have two switches in a stack, that shows up as 10G1 and 20G1 as port one on switch one and port one on switch two. And you can lag between those two ports within the stack. Nick, your stonks on the rise. We have some SG 3300s if anyone needs to buy any. That's what we should have did. Have a vendor, you shield the vendor, and then I sell it for way more than it's worth. Yeah, okay. We're not selling any. We're keeping them in stock. We need them. We do need them desperately. We need more. We need more. If anyone who has Neckier S3300s, we'll buy them off you. Supply oh, chain. For for up to depending on this for the 52 port poe switch for up to two grand a piece uh that means that two switches run a single stp instance so it will totally burn if a stack cable is cut yes and no he said no um we what so again we stack when we stack it's we 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 stack in a loop so we have um it's like a ring topology for the stacking cables. And that way there's two paths that it can go in. So when they're both, when both paths are up, it's one and a half times the performance of the link speed. The older switches were, were stacking at two and a half gigs. The newer switches stack at 10 gig. When you have two of them up, it's 10 gig times one and a half as the speed. If you cut a path, then it will seamlessly and without you noticing, fail over to their other path or just direct traffic to the other path. You won't even drop a packet at most. Your latency will go up slightly um, and then drop back down. We've seen that in real life testing. Um, however, if your wiring is bad on both stacking ports and someone's messing with the area of where the cables are going and they're trying to move wires around and whatever, they could create a broadcast storm that is reminiscent of the issue that I've been dealing with for five years at the specific school that I posted in the AVIC the other day, like a month ago. Uh, Jason, I still don't know what you mean by MLAG specifically, but in terms of STP, the switch is seen, the stack is seen as one switch. So there's only one route across the entire stack. Does that make sense? Mandy, I don't like you anymore. Why is that? Because now the chat is doing networking jokes. <laughs> and I, I get them, but I, it's only like barely. You know, I had a conversation. Oh. Yeah, OK. So we it does multi-switch LACP. And what do you mean by, why do you think it would be a problem for for STP? I mean, that's how the school is set up and STP is working fine. We've got, we have the 
the topology of the network that I just described, they had that problem, which we determined was bad wiring. We fixed it. Um, there's like six stacks of S3300s that are across the buildings in each building. I don't know. You're asking technical questions that I, I don't know the answer to, but it seems to work. <laughs> I already told him to stop doing acronyms. No, I know what he's asking. I just don't know which switch is doing it. I have no idea. So the way it works is each stack, Jason has um, a fiber port on the stack going to the uh, core switch for that region, so to speak, for that area. And that core switch is an M4300. It's a single switch, no stack. So I've got a beautiful idea. Here's my beautiful idea. Yeah, start a new Zoom. <laughs> nope, I'm not gonna start a new anything. Yeah. Next, we're gonna end this GeekCast. It has been a pleasure. We will, uh, for all those who would like to join a couple of the admins hanging out, answering questions, having fun, we will have the, uh, and I'm totally not stealing this from anywhere at all, the uh, GeekCast after hours party. Um, <laughs> Uh, I will post a Zoom link in GeekCast, um, and feel free to join. It's open bar, your bar, not mine. Um, so, you know, uh, we'll end this here. Uh, it's been beautiful. You can ask all your specific questions that you have about spanning trees and uh, round trees and square trees and, and UDP jokes. Blueberry bushes. And uh, multicast jokes and stuff. At what point does a vendor's bad behavior justify the cost of switching away from a sticky business core product? That's a good question. Uh, that is going to be a business decision, my friend. <laughs> you have to make that determination. Is the bad behavior impacting who you are how, and whether or not it's worth the money you're making? Uh, and if it's not, if you're if you're willing to sell your this is basically what you're doing. Sell your, your values and say, I understand that this is my core value, but I'm willing to betray them for this money. If you're willing to do that, then that's that's your decision. Because um, that's essentially what you're saying. I think it's more of saying the cost that the MSP bears of switching a core product that they use. At what point does the bad behavior of said vendor that they're switching from justify the internal cost to migrate so even if it's not money you're making up front it's still the same question it is so in reality okay so let, let, let's run this for me I, I like i said it depends right that's a business decision let's run it through my what i would do in my critical thinking uh my first question is what kind of bad behavior is it and can i mitigate it is that is that bad behavior something that I can hide from my clients with my good behavior? Or is it impacting my ability to service my clients to the level that I promised them? That's the first question. Now, if the, question, if the answer to that question is no, you can't hide it, and it's clearly evident to your clients, then there's no, there's no further questions at that point. It doesn't matter. You have a business where you're providing a service, and you're, you want to provide that service to a certain level, it doesn't make a difference how much it costs. Uh, you you want to stay in that business. You want to do it to that level. You either have to change your business core values and say, this is who I am now, or you have to take that cost and switch. That's it. Um, if the answer is yes, you can hide it. Then it goes into, well, okay, how much does it cost me to hide that? And is that cost equal to or less than what the cost it would be to switch? Yeah, when's the return, the ROI for that cost? Right. Let's There's always going to be a now. tipping point, yep. right? That's that's the name of one of the things I'm working on internally in my head. Tipping point. That's going to be the point where it's no longer worth it to do what you're doing. And you need to make that change. And you have to find that tipping point based off questions that you're going to ask and consider. When I say, again, ask questions, I mean to yourself, to your team, if you have an executive team. Um, these are things that you should be considering, looking at, and evaluating. That's a good answer. And that 
is the perfect way to end the stream. Um, I appreciate every person who's joined us today. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm like I said, I'm going to put the Zoom link in the GeekCast for the totally not ripped off from anywhere GeekCast after party. Um, uh, you guys have a fantastic evening, and see you next month. <laughs>